Welcome to Storyline, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in as we continue our series we've entitled Think Different, where we're riffing on the personality and creative work of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was a remarkable person in many ways, some positive, some negative. He had such a strong personality that he often forced things into existence that other people told him were impossible to achieve. And this was positive in some ways because it gave us some of the products that we have come to know and love. But at the same time, it also had a negative downside, and there was a term that was developed all the way back in 1981 to describe him. They referred to the Steve Jobs reality distortion field. Now, sometimes this was a good thing, but often it was a bad thing because Steve Jobs was known to listen to people's creative ideas, shoot the ideas down, and then a week or two later emerge presenting the very idea of somebody else that he shot down as his own creative idea. This was a very sophisticated form of lying that Steve Jobs became infamous for among those who worked with him at Apple Computer. Now, I want to explore with you the fact that we are witnessing in our world a reality distortion field regarding the doctrine of hell, sometimes referred to as eternal torment. I'm going to suggest to you that this is without question the most sophisticated lie that has ever been imposed upon the human race. So let's explore what the Bible has to say about hell from a different perspective. Let's think different for a moment about hell by engaging with scripture. I want to begin with exploring the word fire as it is used in scripture. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29, a very simple but odd statement is made. Our God is a consuming fire. What are we to take from this? Is God literally composed of flames? Or is the prophet telling us that God is a very high source of energy that is both positive and negative depending on the contact that it has with varying materials. Consider the fact that fire is like this. Fire either consumes or purifies depending on the composition of the material with which fire has contact. And the same is true throughout Scripture regarding the fiery presence of God. The presence of God, when encountered, produces one of two net effects. A negative net effect in some cases, a positive net effect in other cases. Explore it with me in Isaiah chapter 33, starting with verse 10. You have to track very carefully with what's being described here because it goes pretty deep into what it looks like for different kinds of people to encounter God. Now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. So right out of the gate here, this passage is describing God lifting himself up to, to full visual exposure to human beings at some point in human history. And then the next verse says, you, speaking to a group of people that are encountering God, you shall consume, conceive, excuse me, chaff. And you, speaking of a particular category of people, the wicked, the lost, you shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall destroy you. Notice the presence of God, like fire, has the effect of destroying or devouring these individuals. And the people shall be like the burnings of lime. Like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. The wicked, according to this passage of scripture, when they finally encounter God, are consumed by the fire of God's presence. 
Now, that's not the most fascinating part of this passage because it goes on in the next verse to pose a question that we really don't see coming. The sinners in Zion are afraid, the passage says. Fearfulness has, has surprised or seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Notice the language. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? So the presence of God here is likened to a devouring fire that is eternal. It is an everlasting fire. And the question is posed, who will dwell, who will live in this devouring fire? And the answer in the next verse is fascinating. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, he who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. This is describing the righteous, not the wicked. Previously in the passage, the wicked encounter the presence of God and are consumed by his fiery presence. But here the question is posed, who will survive the fire? Who will abide in it? Who will live in the fire and yet not be consumed by the fire? The righteous, the passage answers, will live in the fire of God's presence and apparently feel perfectly at home there because they are not destroyed by the fire. And then these words in verse 17, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. This is fascinating. The fiery presence of God consumes and destroys one class of human beings, one category of human beings, namely the wicked, the incorrigibly lost who are incapable of love, while at the same time, the people of God, the righteous, those who are participatory in the love of God as the principle of their own life, well, they encounter the presence of God. They are not consumed by the fiery energy of his presence, but rather they see beauty in God. The encounter with the fire of God's presence is beautiful to them. But what's beauty got to do with it? Well, scripture is full of this concept that God himself is beautiful and that the beauty of God's character constitutes the perfection of his character and the righteousness of his love. In Psalm chapter 50, notice the language carefully here. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Notice the language. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. Notice the language. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. So you have a collection of ideas in a single passage. You have God, who is described as utter and complete perfection. And that utter and complete perfection that is the character of God is described as beautiful. And that utterly perfect character of God that is beautiful is described as, in some sense, equivalent to the fire of God's character. This is fascinating because throughout scripture, we have certain aspects of the character of God that are associated with fire. Consider Exodus chapter 24 and verse 17. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the tops of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. In this passage, the glory of God is associated with fire. The people encounter the glory of God and it appears to them to be as fire. In Deuteronomy, we read these words. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. Notice this. He shone forth from Mount Paran and he came with ten thousands of 
of saints. Now notice this. From his right hand came what kind of law? A fiery law for them, for the people. Yes, he loved the people. In this passage, God's law is associated with fire. It is called a fiery law. And then the passage says God loves the people. God's law, God's love equated with fire. What's going on here? In the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, we read these words. Uh, the Shulamite woman speaking to her beloved Solomon says, Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love, check this out, is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol, that is the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire. Notice these words, the very flame of the Lord. Here in this passage, the love of the Lord is associated with flames of fire. The fiery passion of love that exists between a man and a woman is described as originating from the heart of God. And that love, that passionate love that emerges from God's heart and finds manifestation between a man and a woman in love is associated with fire in Scripture. So both the wicked and the righteous go into the fire. This is a very strange concept at first glance. The Bible clearly teaches that all of us as human beings are essentially destined for the same place, full, unveiled encounter with the presence of God, which is a consuming fire to the wicked, but is life to the righteous. Both the wicked and the righteous go in to the same fire with two diametrically opposite outcomes. The wicked are destroyed by the fiery presence of God. The righteous stand in the presence of God and behold beauty. They thrive and flourish in the fire that is God's presence. This is so remarkable. When we come to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we encounter again the final demise of the wicked, of the etern those who are eternally lost. We encounter again the idea of fire and the effect that it has. Notice chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. This is God. The throne is exalted, which is seen by all who are in his presence. And notice it says that as God is exalted upon his great white throne, that there is an impulse to flee away from his face, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And here in this following line, the last line of verse 11, we have some language that is just heart-wrenching. Speaking of the wicked, the lost, the incorrigibly self-centered who have so embedded selfishness in their personalities and characters that there is no return. Notice it says, and there was found no place for them. The final destiny of the wicked, the eternally lost, is described with the words, there was found no place place for them. I would suggest to you that this is the saddest line in the Bible. God would give them a place in his eternal kingdom if he could, but there is no place for them in a universe that is only governed by the principle of self-sacrificing love. So we see then that the wicked are destroyed from the inside out, not from the outside in. They are destroyed from the inside out, not from the outside in. The very capacity for other-centered love is gone from their souls. And the wicked person, the eternally lost person at this point, has no consciousness of the fact that they have lost the capacity 
for other-centeredness. They've lost the very, the very ability to love, and they don't know it, and there is no place for them in God's vast universe of love. The final destruction of the wicked, you guys, is not an arbitrary decision on the part of God. God doesn't just get ticked off and lose patience one day and decide to destroy. The destruction of the wicked starts on the inside, in their characters, in their hearts, in their minds, in the way that they gradually morph themselves in the direction of the decision not to love others, not to love God, to put self first over and over and over again until it becomes habitual. It is the final outcome of persistent choices contrary to love on the part of the person that results in their destruction. To engage in and then to justify and then to normalize and then to solidify selfishness in our character finally entails, entails crossing a line from which a person will not even want to return because selfishness will be so deeply entrenched in the identity that the very awareness of the idea of love will be absent from their souls. This is astounding. The greatest novelist of all time by many people's estimation, Dostoevsky, said, what is hell? And he gave this telling answer. I maintain that it is the suffering of being unable to love. This fits perfectly with what we see described in scripture. God is love. God is sheer perfection of love. God is good. God is righteous. God is holy. And the absence of love in the human being causes the very presence of God to be destructive to the human being. And then we come back to Revelation chapter 20 and we see that the wicked, the incorrigibly selfish, they, they go up on the breadth of the earth and they surround the camp of the saints and of the beloved city. And notice these words, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is definitely an echo from Isaiah chapter 33, which we've already read. The wicked are destroyed by the fire of God's presence. Then the devil, it says, who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will, this is amazing, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This language obviously is speaking in terms of exaggeration for effect. Throughout scripture, forever is used as a hyperbole for as long as a person's situation or life lasts. It is not describing eternal torment in the sense of an ongoing, never-ending conscious torture forever and ever. We know this because the next verse says, then death and Hades, or hell, were cast into the lake of fire. And notice these words, this is the second death. The fire that comes down from God out of heaven in verse 9, as we just read, says that it will devour, it will destroy the wicked. They will not consciously exist in eternal torment. They will be tormented in their initial encounter with the presence of God, and the presence of God will destroy them. Not because God is in himself inherently destructive, but because the character of God is pure love and all there is in them is pure selfishness that cannot survive in the presence of God. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, verse 15 says. The lake of fire that devours and destroys, not a lake of fire that they will exist in for all eternity future in conscious torment. The fire consumes the devil 
and the wicked, and this is why it is called the second death. This is the consistent testimony of Scripture. For example, in Ezekiel 28, the final demise of the devil himself is described with these words. God says to Satan, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it, this fire, shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth, and never shalt thou be any more. Satan himself will be consumed to ashes by the fiery presence of God, and will be ashes on the earth and cease to exist. In the book of Psalms, the wicked are described as engaging in an encounter with God that results in them perishing. The wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish away. Into smoke they shall vanish away. The wicked are described here as perishing, which is equivalent to vanishing out of existence, not continuing to suffer eternal torment. And then in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 3, describing the final demise of the eternally lost, it says to the righteous, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes, ashes, you guys, under the soles of your feet. And then in Obadiah, we have these words, they, speak, speaking of the wicked, shall be as though they had never been. This is consistent with the most popular text in scripture that almost everybody has heard quoted, if not read for themselves. In John 3.16, we have the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, perish, but have everlasting life. We just read in scripture that to perish is to vanish away, to cease to exist. Coming back to our opening passage, according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29, there is some sense in which our God is a consuming fire. The author Ellen White very insightfully quotes this passage and offers the follow, following commentary on what it means for God to be a consuming fire. She says, and I'm quoting, to sin, to sin wherever found, God is a consuming fire. If you choose sin and refuse to separate from it, the presence of God which consumes sin must consume you. Our God is a consuming fire, not to the saved, not to the redeemed, not to the righteous, but God is a consuming fire to the incorrigibly wicked, to those who are eternally and finally lost. In another passage, with brilliant insight, Ellen White describes the final demise of Satan and the wicked in this way. Speaking of the destruction of the lost, she says this, that is the destruction of the wicked, is not an arbitrary it is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. That sentence alone is extremely insightful. It is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God that the wicked are destroyed. Notice this. The rejecters of God's mercy reap that which they have sown. God is the fountain of life. Notice, God is the fountain of life. And when one chooses the service of sin, well, what is that person doing by default? He separates from God and thus cuts himself off from life. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop their character and reveal their principles. But check this out. This accomplished... They receive the results of their own choice. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves, notice this, place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. 
the glory of him who is love will destroy them. Notice it is the love of God, which is by its very nature merciful and compassionate and redeeming. But that same love, when persistently rejected, produces changes and alterations in the personality and character of the sinner so that finally the very presence of God and his love is to them a consuming fire. So according to scripture, we have what we might call a double destruction. First of all, the human being engages in a series of choices that deeply embeds them in a path, in a course of life that changes and, and alters their personality and character until that person is so deeply identified with selfishness that love is no longer a capacity that they're even familiar with. So they have destroyed the fine mechanisms of their own minds and hearts. Their psychology has become deeply deranged in selfishness and the very capacity, the ability to love has vanished from them. Having been destroyed on the inside psychologically, it is then and only then that scripture says that God reveals himself in the final judgment of mankind. And in that final revelation, the righteous will bask in God's presence, flourish in God's presence, but the fire that is the presence of God will devour the wicked. They will be destroyed physically, externally, because of the destruction of themselves that they have effected by choices of selfishness over and over and over again without repentance, without changing course, until their very personalities and characters are so out of harmony with the character of God that his very presence to them will be destructive. So thinking different about hell. Steve Jobs was known for engaging in reality distortion. The greatest reality distortion in the history of mankind is the idea of eternal torment, which makes God out to be a sadistic monster. The truth of the matter is that God is love, and that's all. God is love in totality, perfect love, and that love itself is something with which human beings either find harmony with or disharmony with. And those who are so out of sync with the love of God will find themselves destroyed by the very presence of God in the final, the final scenes of human history. God is love and the destruction of the wicked is not an arbitrary act of power on his part. It is simply the outworking of the choices of those who are eternally lost the glory of him who is love will devour them, will destroy them. Our God is a consuming fire and he will be a consuming fire for all eternity. And you and I, we're invited to find ourselves perfectly at home in the beautiful presence of God by living our lives by the grace of God in harmony with his character.